coaches move from one job to another for a number of reasons. Staffs get fired when they don't win enough. Coaches leave to pursue more lucrative financial offers or higher profile gigs. Right. Your circumstances ending up at SMU are pretty unusual because you're coaching at UAB and the program was shut down from under you, basically. How much did you and the other UAB coaches know that was coming? We didn't really, really have any idea. I mean, we all thought that if we went to a bowl game that we would be good to go, like everybody else. Six and six, we thought that was good enough to sustain and end up not being about wins and losses. It was just about politics and finances and things like that. So we just kind of, it, it, was what, it is what it is. It's, it's tough. We all saw pictures of the players, right? very emotional. Some of them with tears, some of them yelling and screaming, hugging each other. What was it like when you and the other coaches closed the doors to the office and were talking among yourselves? What was that like to have to be told that your jobs were no longer there? Uh, for real? <laughs> I think that was the first question we all asked and kind of sat there and stunned. I mean, in November they came out and they made mention that it was probably going to happen in the media. And that was one of our rallying cries was to give them on November to remember. And that was something that we constantly said as a coaching staff and to the players and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, we ended up going two and two in November, I think it was, and, and uh, got us to a bowl game. Um, we were doing some really good things on, on the field, and obviously the stands were getting filled up, so we thought that it was going to be a, a success. But um, I think when the president came in and, and told us, we were we kind of knew, you know, and you knew you knew in the back of your head, but you didn't really want to believe it. Everyone knows that in addition to developing student athletes and trying to win games on Saturdays, college athletics is at its core a business. Mm -hmm. Did that whole experience change your your view or your thoughts about being involved in college athletics? No, not at all. I mean, the kids are awesome, and the staffs that you're with are are fantastic. So the, a lot of those guys. We still stay in contact with. I have players from UAB that call me all the time and just want to talk, whether it's I recruited them or they were in my position or they play something on special teams or they're on defense or offense. They just want to talk and just and just talk, and that's why you get into it. You know, those guys that are one of my best friends on that on that staff just had a baby two two three days ago, and he sends me pictures and sent me a picture right when it came out. He sent me a picture of him with the with the whole gear on, and you know, it, you just great, get great relationships. And that's why you really do it. Throughout your career, you've coached a lot of different positions. You've coached on defense, the line, the linebackers, and in the secondary. On offense, you've coached quarterbacks and receivers. As a special teams coach, you're coaching guys who were primarily recruited to do something else. Right. They're a linebacker first, or a safety, or a receiver, or whatever it is, and they also play special teams. How much harder is it to be a special teams coach than to be one of the traditional position coaches? It's better, really. Because you get to coach even the O-line, which I would never really normally come into contact with if I'm on the defensive side of the ball or if you coach the receivers, you don't mess with those big hogs up front, you know. So it's actually nice to be able to, to interact with all the, all the players on the team. You get to interact with all the coaches on the team. You can spend more time with the head coach because he wants to know more about what's going on and he'll even ask you what, what's little Johnny, what's his reaction to you, what's his reaction to what's going on with the team. So it's actually better. Um, to get them to buy in, it's football. It's, it's football. If you can teach them how to play the game, whatever that's a linebacker or that's the, you know, the wing on the punt team or whatever. If you can teach them how to execute that position successfully, then they're going to buy in and they're going to execute as hard as they can. And that's the good part about coaching. Some special teams coaches start their career there, but does your experience coaching all those other different positions give you a leg up when it comes to? evaluating players and being able to determine what they can do for you on your special teams? I don't know. I, th I think the, the the teams are usually, each each unit on special teams is different, and each position requires specific people or body types to fit into that, to that unit or to that position on that unit. So I think just the unit itself, the what you want to get out of that unit, then you, it, that leads to what you want to get out of that position within that unit, so then you take from the team and put into that unit or into those positions that fit that unit. So it's its its own deal. So it's its own moment on the field. So it has your own position that deals with that. So you take from what's out there on the team and put it in there. So I wouldn't say because I coach linebackers that I know I need this guy. It's just 
I coach the punt return team, so therefore I know how big, how fast, how smart that kind of kid that I need in that position with that punt return, if that makes any kind of sense. You coached from 2007 to 2010. You were a defensive graduate assistant at Clemson University. And many people may assume that's where you first met Chad Morris, but he actually didn't start there till the following year. So when and where did you first meet and get to know Coach Morris? Well, he was actually coming in uh, at that 2011 spring. And I was, I've already graduated my master's degree. I was still myself and one of my other GA buddies were still one of the only two GAs to graduate from Clemson as a GA because they, usually those guys move and they go on a lot faster than what my buddy and I did. And obviously, I spent four years there, so um, which was fantastic because I got to coach all the special teams phases. And Andre Powell was the guy at Clemson who said, well, Riley, why don't you coach left side of the punt team? right side of the kickoff, so on and so forth. So that experience was fantastic, but Coach Morris came in in the spring of 11 as I was on my way out of spring of 11. So we had a spring together to coach. And I think between Coach Stepp, Coach Craddock, Coach Fry, some of the guys that are on this staff currently, they knew who I was from the Clemson days, and that's really, Coach Morris knew me, a couple of guys on staff here at SMU already knew me, UAB thing falls apart. They're trying to get another guy that knows me, and just word of mouth, it got to, it got to me, and that was, here we are. Okay, I was going to say, Coach Morris got hired at SMU very shortly after the bizarre scenario in right. Birmingham. What circumstances fell into place that ended up with you coming to SMU and joining the staff? I think we got cut. I think the program got cut. Um, you know, 29th of November, 1st of December, and Coach Morris got hired right about that same time. And then um, December 10th or 11th, he called me, and we were still, it, you know, I guess the wound was still pretty fresh. Um, I remember sitting in my car talking to him in the parking lot at UAB, and there's, some, there's a team, a coach from another school, taking photos of one of our players to try to get him to come to that school. So I'm talking to Coach Morris, and I'm looking over here, looking at, they're just taking my, one of my returners, and, and they just want to take photos of them and recruit them, and like, this is kind of weird. But, um, you know, I looked at that kid, and he had to do what he's got to do, and that coach has got to do what he had to do for that kid. And then for his program, and Coach Morris is calling me saying, well, why don't you come on an interview? So it was awkward. But I think right about December 10th or 11th, he, he, called, me on, he called me on the phone, wanted me to come up on an interview. Sometime later on, maybe a week later, I flew up to SMU and uh, had the interview. And, he called me about four or five days later, and here we are. So, At UAB, you coach special teams and outside linebackers. Mm -hmm. When you had those initial conversations with Coach Morris, was it understood you were interviewing four special teams, or did you express any interest in coaching linebackers with Coach McDaniel, too, or something? Right. It's always a goal to be on the field, to be a uh, position coach, and to be in front of the room, and to have your guys, and so that's always the end result. Um, but Coach Morris knew that he had his full-time nine guys, and, and, and I knew what I was getting into, so here we are. All right, if, if the scenario of the UAB program being taken away wasn't bizarre enough, the school then reversed its decision and last month announced that football will come back after all. Um, and the announcement was made that your former head coach, Bill Clark, is still going to be the coach. Right. Did he reach out to you to stick around, or did you have any temptation to stay in Birmingham and sort of finish what you started? Yeah, I think there's always that temptation to stay. I mean, that's to be honest, absolutely. You know, but um, Coach Clark called me, and I was already here. My wife is here. Uh, Coach Morris' the staff is awesome. We've got things in place. We're, we're running the, the special team system the way we want, the way we as a staff want to run it, the way Coach Morris wants to run it. <clears throat> I'm excited about the way we're running it. Um, so we're here, and it's just not right from, I don't want to say a business standpoint, but just from a loyalty standpoint, it's not right to pick up and go in, Jan in June. It's not right to pick up and go in July. I mean, the SMU players are counting on me to be here. The coaches are counting on me to be here. Coach Morris is counting on me to be here. My wife's counting on me to be here. So all those factors, in, in, go, go, they kind of take a factor of what we're trying to do. And I want to be loyal to Coach Morris and the staff and the players. They're loyal to me. And that, in the end, outweighed the decision to go back and pick up with whatever pieces left and try to 
recreate some magic. And I think we had a great run at, at UAB. It was awesome. It was a great situation. It was the right time. It was, we had the right players. We had the right staff. Everything was fit right for us to be successful. And I think we can do the same thing here. And I want to emulate that success even greater. All right, you mentioned that when you came to SMU, Coach Morris already had his full-time nine assistant coaches in place. So your title is actually special teams analyst. For those watching this, what's the difference? Uh, the biggest difference is, is my instruction to the players on the field is zero. And my instruction to the players in the film room are zero. So I really can't communicate to the players um, specifically other than you know hustle, good work, things like that. To the coaching staff, I can instruct them on how to be a better special teams coach. And that's really what my role is, is to coach the special teams through those guys and help those, those other coaches become better coaches as far as what we're trying to get across in special teams. So it's a little unique for me because I'm usually the one running the show, but in this case, Coach Gunn and the rest of the staff get to kind of coach and, and, and experience something that they have not experience as much in, the, in their careers. So it's going to make them better. It's going to make Coach Morris better. In the end, it's going to you know, make myself better because if I was to be a special teams coordinator two or three years from now, either here or someplace else, I will have a better kind of grasp of how to coach that coach to be better at his returners or at his left tackle spot or at his right side of the kickoff team. I'll have a better idea of how to coach that coach who can coach his players so I can kind of delegate a little bit better. So I think that's kind of, it's a unique role, but it's going to make the whole program better because we're all going to be more in tune to special teams in a much more way than what they ever thought they could be. When coming to a new team, obviously you've got to identify players and the strengths and weaknesses of different guys. At some of the positions, it may be I don't know if easier is the right word, but you look at speed, you look at size, whatever. Special teams, you got a wide variety of players who need to play for you. Right. What are the first things you look for when you start watching the practice uh, in the spring to evaluate which guys are going to contribute in the fall? I think the first thing I did is I went to the weight room, and most of the other staff was still recruiting when I got here. So I was able to go in the weight room the first three or four days and just kind of look at body types. That's the biggest thing. You want to get the longer leaner, more athletic type kit that you want to try to uh, use and put them in different spots in special teams. Once you get through those really long and good looking body types, you work your way to guys that aren't maybe as long or as big and you want to find out where can those parts go. So you obviously don't want a, you know, a 6'4", 230 pound kid out at the safety spot on, on kickoff. You know? So now you can kind of Work your big to small. That's kind of how we usually go about it. And within the first three days, I picked I picked out body types, I picked out athleticism, and then I picked out leaders. And that's probably the biggest thing that you really want to do. Is you want to get guys that can lead. So you don't want to overload a team with a whole bunch of leaders because you can't play um, your starters on all four units. So you want to try to move your leaders around throughout the other units that you have to that you have to play with. So uh, you want to get leaders on punt team, kickoff, punt return, and kickoff return. They can't be the same dudes. So you gotta try to find who the leaders are beyond what their body types are. And then you talk to them, and you figure out how smart they are, what their football intelligence is, and then you start moving other pieces around. So it's kinda like a puzzle. You put it together by the way they look, the way they talk, the way they act, the way they move, and you kinda formulate a picture that way. So, so how much say do you have in which guys play for you? Presuming that quarterbacks are sort of off right. limits, but beyond that, <laughs> right. Um, do you have to go to the coaches and lobby saying I want this safety and I want that receiver and that running back or do the coaches give you a group of players and say here's what you've got now work your magic? Well, that's from Coach Morris and the minute I got here Coach Morris says whatever Riley needs is what we need as a, as, as a staff and as a team for special teams and that was awesome. Um, it's going to be tough because you don't want to take the top receiver and the guy you're going to throw verticals with and the guy you're going to throw posts with and your go-to guy, you don't want to burn that guy up on special teams. And, you know, maybe Coach Craddock will say, hey, you know, I don't know if we can use this guy all the time. So, well, if I know this, if at the last couple places I've been, every time we've got the ball on a kickoff return to the 40-yard line, we've scored. And at UAB, we got the ball to the 40-yard line 15 times. And we scored on all 15 of them. Now, J.J. Nelson, he scored on four of those. So 
you would think as an offensive staff, once you throw that stat, well, maybe we can use that guy for kickoff return. So you use him on kickoff return, but you don't use him on kickoff, where he'll go down there and, and run into somebody and could get hurt. So you, you use those top players in, di in different spots. That's a question I get asked a lot is, do starters play? Starters play, period. It's just where do they play and how much do they play? And that's kind of the, the, the key that you got to get through uh, within some spring practice and in fall camp. You kind of figure out where those starters are going to play and how much they're going to play and kind of what specific positions. So everyone's been good. They say whatever you need, go ahead and do it. And it's been good. Some special teams coaches are obviously the architect of the protection and the coverage units and that kind of thing. There are others who have a background in kicking or punting and are really analytical and, and technicians when it comes to that. How much experience do you have teaching kicking and punting, or are you more the coverage and protection kind of guy? Uh, I'm probably more of the coverage and protection side. I'm just dangerous enough to screw everybody up on the uh, technique side. But uh, the good part is I don't get to instruct them anyway, so they get, they get to go and do what they need to do. I think for the most part, um, they watch film on themselves and they critique themselves. Kickers and punters, they already know. They know when, they're, when their plant foot's too far ahead or too far away or too far behind the ball. They know if the drop on the punt is outside or inside or they know if their leg swing is across their body or those kinds of things. So they kind of already know the mechanics of, of how to kick and how to punt and how to snap. Um, so the good part is I don't, I don't, get, to, I don't get to instruct them to screw them up. So um, it's, it, it'll be all right. You have a lot of guys with pretty unique a lot of positions that require unique skill sets, whether it's kicker, punter, deep snapper, uh, the return guys. What's the hardest one to fill? They're all hard. They're all difficult. I think when you deal with special teams, the guys that impact the football are the ones that, that really make the special teams stand out. Uh, it's the players around those guys that help make the special teams be extremely successful, that make those guys that impact the ball successful. So. Just talking about kickoff. The kicker can put the ball in the end zone, but he's not going to have 40 touchbacks in a year. If he has 40, that's great. But you're going to kick off at least 80, you hope. So there's 40 other kickoffs that someone has to, has to cover. Um, same thing on punt. If he punts the ball to the right, you've got to have the correct guys to get down the field to stand in front of the returner so that he runs a fair catch. Vice versa, your return game is as good as your returner is. But if the guys blocking aren't doing a very good job and your return is not very good so it, they all kind of go hand in hand so I think all of it's all of it's I don't know it's, it's difficult to, to fill all of them the specific guys you can usually find a, a great returner you can usually pick a guy out you can do it you just got to give him enough reps to catch the football um, I think recruiting a great punter and a great kicker <clears throat> come along with how much time you're going to spend on special teams same thing with a great long snapper if you're program is only going to spend 10 minutes a day on special teams and you're not a top you know five program in the country it's going to be hard to fill a great punter and a great kicker um, so the more time we spend on special teams the more we can showcase special teams being important to SMU and coach Morris's program the better kicker and punter you're going to get that's been the case so far um, I think that it's the players around those kickers and punters that you got to find that kind of relationship, that kind of chemistry to make that unit go, and that's probably the more difficult part. The kickers, punters, returners, if you work hard and if you take care of special teams, those guys will come to you. It's everybody else that's a linebacker or a defensive end or a tight end, getting those guys to come together and be uh, have a great relationship and have great chemistry to understand what's going on, that's what makes those kickers, punters, returners, long snappers stand out and be more successful, if that be. Your specialists, by definition, they don't get a whole lot of snaps, the kicker and the punter, and they both play positions where mistakes are very obvious to those watching the game. Last year's starting punter, Jackson Kuntz, got kicked in the deep end and had to play as a true freshman. Whoever ends up kicking and punting for you this year is going to be young. Your place kicker is going to be new. Right. Does that give you cause for concern, and is there anything you can do to help them prepare for when the bullets fly against Baylor? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely gives cause for concern. You'd like to have, you know, four-year veterans out there kicking and punting who've been through it a lot. That'd be awesome. Um, 
But I think the things you do is you try to put them in situations, you try to make them comfortable, you try to make them understand what the rest of the unit's trying to do. And from a place kicker, the minute you take your walk off and you do your breath, you either made it or missed it. Nothing you can do about it. But once the ball hits your foot, it's your operation and consistency that gets to that football that makes you successful. So that's what you focus on. Um, a kickoff, you've got to get into a rhythm. You got to have the same steps back and the same steps sideways and the same rhythm as approach to the football every single time. You either made it or you missed it. From a punt standpoint, it's repetition over and over and over. It's your catch, it's your steps, it's your drops over and over and over again. Whether you're in front of 100,000 or 5,000, it doesn't matter. Those repetitions have to stay the same. And that's once you get those kids to understand it's repetition, it's not the result, it's the process of how you get to that result is what really matters. Focus on the process not the result. That's when you make the kid go. I've done this a hundred times in practice. I can do it in front of whomever. And as long as those guys on the punt team are protected and doing their job, the punter should be successful. As long as you, you, the guys on kickoff are covering and doing their job, the kicker should be somewhat successful. Um, as long as the old linemen are doing their job and the guys on the field goal protection unit are doing their job, and the operation between the long snapper, the holder, and the kicker are consistent, it should work. It doesn't work all the time. It's human. The game's human, but it, it should work. Punters talk about distance, direction, and hang time, all of which can only be addressed after actually catching the snap and getting the kick away. But once the ball hits the foot, is one of those most important to you in terms of the way you coordinate and cover on, on punts? Oh, hang time. Probably the most, this is the most important one. If it goes 30 yards, but it's up there for five seconds, it's, you're not going to return that ball. So the, the hang time is the most important because that will affect the return. On the other end, the return specialists, beyond just speed, ability to run and cover a lot of ground, what do you look for in a returner? Guts. The guys got to have some guts, especially on the punt team. You know, there's slow guys out there that can catch the football off of balance, off the air, that can get themselves in position and can hit the landmark they're supposed to hit. And if you can do that and have some guts, then, then you, as long as you can feel the football and have some guts, I think it takes guts to feel the football, especially on punt, punt return. So I'd say it takes some guts to, to be back there. When you see a group of guys out at practice as candidates to be return specialists, Presumably, all of them can catch a ball, all of them can run. In your mind, how do you separate which guys are potential punt returners and which ones are kickoff returners? I want to find the same guy if I can. Uh, if, if I can find the same guy, that, that would help out a lot, or the same group of people to do that, that helps out a lot. Um, the spiral from the kickoff is different than, than the flight of the ball from, from punt. So um, some guys do catch it different, some guys don't. I know. Um, there's, there's been conversation in the past that the one kid will come up and say, Coach, I don't like punt. I don't like doing punt return at all. Okay, then you'll stay over there and you'll work on, you'll work on kickoffs. That's great. Work on being your kickoff return guy. That's awesome. And if he brings that to me, that's fantastic. Then you focus on the other guys that, that um, have some experience and that want to do it and, and that kind of thing. So there's some things that we're going to do this year that, that I've gone in some, in some studies that uh, there's some ways to catch the football with that can kind of bind their hands and make them do things and make them move their feet and make them get into position better with their body to help them be a better punt, punt catcher or punt, punt receiver. Um, so that'll be fun and then we're going to try and stand in, stand in the sun as much as we can so that they got to face the sun and make things difficult. But uh, I try to find the same guy. If you can find the same guy who's got the same amount of guts, then the returns are, are pretty consistent, the landmarks are consistent. The, the, the teaching is a little more consistent. That'll help coach step out. So. There are some teams, Virginia Tech comes to mind, that are known for having standout special teams every single year. And one aspect that certainly gets a lot of attention is blocking kicks. How much time do you spend devising ways to get to the punter or the kicker, and is that something you focus on this year, or do you spend your first year simply ironing out all the kinks with protection and coverage and maybe not being as aggressive on going after blocks. 
Well, I think any special teams unit, if you can cover, you'll be okay. <clears throat> if you can cover, you'll be fine. You can change field position strictly by covering. If you can field the ball on, on punt return, you're going to be fine. But I think each, within each game or each game plan, there's a scenario and a time when you need to rush the punt. You need to have a leaper on field goal block. Um, you need to do something middle or edge field goal block wise. So we're going to focus on every aspect and every phase of special teams. The faster you, you build that base, the faster you can build the, everything else on top of it. So we've done that in spring. The kids have done a great job. Every day we're working on some sort of block technique or some sort of block drill dealing with the punt return. So that's, that's going to be definitely one of our foundations. Some special teams coaches are called aggressive or creative when they mix in trick plays, laterals on punt returns, uh, you know, fake field goals or punts, that kind of thing. Would you call yourself aggressive and creative in that way, or do you have a more conservative approach and limit those? Yeah, I think that's called smart. Uh, you know, it, you're only you're smart when it works. You know, so I would say that's that's probably. I don't know if it's aggressive, but I would say it's it's smart. When you're when you deal, you got to be multiple. You deal with special teams. You've got to be as multiple as possible. I'm not dodging your question at all. Um, yeah, we're gonna have fakes in there. Absolutely. Coach Morse is aggressive. He's an aggressive-minded, offensively-minded football coach. So, one of the things he asked was to be aggressive, and, and he wanted to know kind of my flavor on that. And you have to be multiple. So, multiple is going to include fakes. It's going to include formations. It's going to include, um, you know, different times to run those fakes and those formations. But you also got to be intelligent when you run those. You don't want to run fakes when the time or the score on the clock or the quarter or whatever situation doesn't deserve a fake, then don't run a fake. You got to be smart when you do it. So, you got to be intelligent when you call those calls, and that's going to be a conversation that that Coach Morrison and I go through in the game. And I'll be saying, you want to run it now? And he'll say no. And he'll ask me if I want to run it now. I'll say no. And so those situations are going to happen. And it's going to go back and forth. So you got to know when to run them, know why you're running them. And I think that's what makes those fakes successful. But a missed fake or a fake that didn't work out is a lot of times just as successful because all of a sudden the team is like the other team, not the team you're currently playing, but the team next week is going to go, whoa, they have this in their arsenal. We've got to be careful for that. So... Even though if a fake didn't work out, it was designed to work out, it, it didn't happen. We, we ran one against FIU last year at UAB, and the kid should have caught it. He didn't catch it, but the very following week, we got a, a bunch of safe, safe looks because they didn't want to have that fake ran against them. So um, even though it doesn't work, it's still successful in its own right, and we have to always remember that. And i got to tell the coaches and the players, hey, what do you think the next team is thinking? When we just ran this, what do they think? All right, obviously those plays are referred to as tricks because you don't do them often. Right. Uh, they are out of the norm from your regular routine and coaching. But so is that ultimately, are those plays your call or Coach Morris's call? Oh, it's Coach Morris's call. Yeah, I, don't, I, won't, I won't be calling any plays on Saturday anyway. Um, Saturday's another one where I'm, where I'm limited. I think I, I can take a lot of analytical notes and, and provide feedback. And after that, that's when the C Coach Morris will make, will make that call. So, but anytime that the fake opportunity arises itself, I'll be, I'll be gunning for it.